of the metal and so or the, the machine and so <laughs> um, um, quite It's good to do something bad to, to <laughs> weigh it up. Yeah, well, it gives you your, your yeah, yardstick. A bit of perspective. Uh, I, I'm proud of the um, perseverance. Yeah, because it was hard for quite a long time. But by the same token, the perseverance was from the word go. Because when you were watching Top of the Pops or whatever it was, some television thing at the age of 12 and 13, you said, I don't just want to do this or be this. I want this to be my life. It was never meant to be just for a few years. Yeah. It was meant to be forever. So who are we talking about here? We're we talking the Mott, the Hoople, David Bowie, Mark Boland, Lou Reed, all that. Bits and pieces of all that. Okay, what was it about that? Was it the flash and flamboyance of the, wow, that's going to annoy parents, or was it the music? For me, initially, it was it was nothing to do with music. It was music. a fashion flamboyance, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was a lifestyle thing. Yeah. My interest in music came a little bit later. When I found the electronic mu um, music, actually, the day I stumbled across the synthesizer, that really, really fired me up for. But what's the electronic music to you? Is that the Moog or is that Kraftwerk or what is it? No, it's not. It was the Moog for you, the, the actual Moog synthesizer. No, no, the, 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 the synthesizers themselves are just a screwdriver. They're just a tool. It's, I've got no allegiance to any of that stuff whatsoever. But the whole concept of electronic music, be it sampling, synthesizers, plugins these days, whatever it might be, that way of making music is one that I find the most exciting. But I'm not exclusive to that. I still have you know, guitars and drums and bass and all those sure. usual things. But it was that. It, the, the fact that all of a sudden you could just sit in front of these things and with, once you figured out what you were doing, make noises that you just never heard before. That I found exciting. And at that point, music took over from the lifestyle. And it became a more music orientated direction than a lifestyle direction. You were the first to do the synth pop star business, like OMD or um, oh, Soft Cell or Depeche Mode in particular. It went on to conquer America as well. Mm. You know, the, they'll acknowledge the fact, and rightly so, that they would never have done that without Gary Newman. You made synth pop star a reality or cool. Now, did you know you were starting something? I mean, that now, today, is bigger than it ever has been. And I'm talking about all the big bands from Orb to Prodigy and everything else, every one of whom have said Gary Newman, Gary Newman, and Gary Newman. Yeah, um, which is lovely. Um, I, I was aware at the time that it was different. I wasn't aware that it was going to be as big as it was, and I wasn't aware that it would open as many doors as it did. Or that your thunder might be stolen, which is what I'm implying earlier. <laughs> Let's be honest, I mean, is there any kind of... Wait a minute, oh, that's me, I started that. No. Like, the person would be more successful than you, wouldn't you, you know? Everyone has, me. <laughs> Everyone. No, no, I, no not, not at all. I mean, I, it was a really exciting time, but I, but I was aware that it was a fair new kind of music. I think the problem is, when, when you are at the, the front end of something like that, you're the person that opens the door a crack into a new room, into yeah. a new room full of possibilities that hasn't been opened before. And then there's all these really clever people behind you, your you Depeche Modes and your Nine Inch Nails and the really clever people. They kind of trot all over me to, in their rush to take advantage of all this new thing. I'm just still nervously peeking around the corner. And that's how it felt, that I wasn't quick enough to take advantage yeah. of the door that I'd opened. So I've got no... The only person to blame for any of that is me. But what was that kind of neon-tubed, futuristic, chic thing that you had, the kind of android posturing stuff? Like, did that just come about? People stand in front of mirrors with guitars and pretend they're playing a guitar. Yeah. Were you standing in front of <laughs> pretending you're an android? <laughs> yeah, well, a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, really, well, was that any, any way Bowie influenced in any way? I mean, I know that Bowie would, must be an influence, but I don't see that in the stuff I hear about Gary Newman as much. You don't put Bowie at the top of the list. I was a Bowie fan, so it would you know, it'd be difficult to say that some of it couldn't have... You know, I think that whatever you're a big fan of has to influence you in some way or another. And I certainly think that the, um, the, the way I went about creating personas and images to, to front yeah, the music, yeah. that was something that I learned from Bowie, that that was a really... I loved it as a Bowie fan. I loved that side of it when he was doing those sort of things. And I wanted to do that same kind of approach. But yeah. beyond that, you know, now we both got London accents, I guess, but beyond that, I wasn't consciously trying to take right, things. Right, yeah, no, I mean, yeah. I mean, the Telecom third album, or whatever it was, it was, also, it was the third number one album. It was a really big thing. And then after that, you did played some gigs at the Wembley Arena in 1981, and you said, right, that's it, I'm going to retire. As Bowie had done, supposedly, seven or eight years earlier yeah. on, retiring Ziggy and retiring himself and all the rest of it. You said in your autobiography, directly after that, you got up on the stage, an empty stage in Wembley, and you said, 
that was this, this, why did I do this? I don't want to retire. Hold on, that was a mistake. Maybe you're like, but then the people believed that you had retired and they let you go. They retired you for a yeah. while. They went to the other bands I mentioned earlier on. Yeah. Do you think you made a bit of a mistake doing that? That it didn't work? What, what, what were you trying to do? Well, retire. firstly, <laughs> it, it was a huge, a huge mistake. Right. But the biggest one of my entire career, and one that to this day I'm still hampered by. But the reason for it, well, I think, was quite a sensible reason. I was very young, and a huge amount of success had come my way in a very quite short space of time. And, uh, and I'm not in a band, I'm on my own, so I'm kind of dealing with all this. Yeah. didn't even have a manager. Good point. So I'm on my own, dealing with the whole thing. And um, not doing very well, to be honest about it. So what I, the whole thing about retiring was, it was retiring from live work, because I, I thought that... I needed to concentrate on the studio work. My songwriting needed to get better. Mm. I, my voice, I'd never been very happy with my voice. I needed to work on that. I just needed to learn how to write better songs. And that's what I wanted to do. And it seemed to me that all the time I was touring, I wasn't able to do that. And, and it put me right in the public eye. And I had all this problem with the press. And that was really getting me down. And yeah. So I thought, look, the best thing to do is just, just back out of this, concentrate on studio work, grow up without everybody watching. And then sort of just ease back into it when you're slightly more mature and you, you're more happy with your music and, and so on. But because I was young and a bit stupid, rather than just doing that, I have to go and make a big song and dance about it. Right. And say, oh, I'm retiring. Yeah. You know, stupid, good idea, badly executed. And then dance, assassin, yeah. warriors. What was the plan with those things? What was the plan? Like, was it just to be in there making music and hope the public would like it? Yeah, well, initially it was, yeah. For the for, for, for dance and I assassin. It was still from the heart, you know. Um, but then after I assassin really done badly, and I started to panic after that, and that's when I started to think about writing this. You listen to advice, yeah. kiss of death, yeah. listening to advice, because everyone everyone knows best. Everyone you talk to will have their own little pet theory about what you're doing wrong. You should do a ballad. You should do a cover version. You should do this, that, and you know. One bloke said to me, I should do a cover of 16 tons of Number Nine Coal. But you should do the electronic version, that would be great. <sighs> well, whatever. Uh, so that, but that's the trouble. So you end up writing songs that have got a bit of his advice, a bit of record company advice, a bit of this, and they just become a hodgepodge of nothing. If you're talking about that 84, 85, 86, 87, 92, or sorry, 2001, to go way forward for the Pure album, um, they promised this, 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 and this. And you found out later on they were delivering absolutely nothing. You use the word crook kind of earlier on. I know it's a bit throwaway and describes it. Like, I mean, do you ever sort of want to just tear all every root of hair out? It is an ongoing uh, frustration, yeah. The whole record company thing. But I'm not really part of it anymore. No, I? and like these days, who are your friends? It's, it's, it's the band you have on stage, isn't it? Yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a gang again, or it's a gang now for the first time probably in your life, is it? Well, this band have been with me for quite some time quite a long time and they are, yeah they are my closest friends we see each other all the time but m my wife is my closest friend she absolutely helps me through everything some of the stuff from the past the way i mentioned earlier on was is it easy for people to make fun of it i mean like just the way you looked and the way you were and that yeah. but it, that, that, isn't that okay though because I mean, if you can't laugh at something you did years ago then you didn't live really i've got no um ego in that sense whatsoever you know i'm i'm genuinely pleasantly surprised if people like my stuff. I don't expect people to like it, so I'm not hurt and cut to the quick. If okay, you don't like expect people to like it, and we mentioned that in 1992 you were more or less kind of dead and buried, right? Now, since then, people who have come out and talked about everything, not just in the new music that I mentioned earlier, Apology and Orb, they've all come out and said, what a great influence. I mean, this is obviously maybe the, the little bridge to the new credibility of yeah. Gary Newman. Not that that new credibility is something you necessarily crave because the critics can go away in some ways, but it is, it's a nice place to be now, being Gary Newman, and all the names I've just mentioned, they've helped a lot, haven't they? Oh, You're the godfather of something here. <laughs> like, I, I could say pop, I could say rock, I could say everything else, but the one that you like most is the one probably that links all these kind of industrial music. Yeah. So what is industrial music to you? Is it William Burroughs and dark and cold and noisy, or what is it? To me, industrial is, is just a very, very harsh, hard, aggressive end of electronic music. Yeah. Um, not necessarily fast or slow. It doesn't have a particular tempo that it has to follow, but it's invariably aggressive and um, dark. I just love it. I mean, that's, I just feel at home there, really. 
Well, then, if you have a new momentum these days after the Jagged album and that, can you explain where that's coming from, or is it everything we've been saying for the last 20 minutes that demons are gone, good things are in? Um, well, I made that.